you know uh, the basics of linux operating system right uh, and also we'll, we'll take a closer look at uh, you know how to set environment variables right and and how do we set uh, um, and and how do we or, or play around with the commands and things like that uh, and and also a few basic networking commands such as ping right i'm sure uh, uh, those two of you uh, those of you who have uh, used uh, linux in the past would know how to ping uh, another computer or another server from your server right so we can do that and then uh, also um what we can do is what i'm going to do today is to introduce you to uh, shell scripting okay so that um, you know you can basically uh, practice a few shell scripts right and then uh, start getting into a get get into a stage where you'll be able to uh, play around with shell scripts and uh, use the shell scripts to automate things and things like that okay i mean these are again basics so you uh, it is important that you know how do you use shell scripting and how do you use a editor okay and uh, how do you uh, work with files and how do you work with uh, environment variables and so on and so forth and also how do you use processes in uh, linux right so how do you look up for which process is running with the so with so and so name right i mean how do you basically use that in the context of commands okay so these are the things that we are going to cover today right and uh, next uh, three days i mean uh, wednesday thursday uh, friday you know we can actually cover a lot more on the shell scripting part okay uh, we can actually uh, cover a little more and if time permits you know we can actually get started with uh, the python because uh, knowing python and using python is going to be very very important okay so that's where you know you will uh, get a lot more flexibility right and uh, at some point you know you can actually take up uh, linux and uh, you know start learning more on linux but you know we will actually get started with python probably in a couple of days time two to three days time okay all right um so let me share my screen and uh, we can take it from there yeah so just let me know if you're able to see my screen yes we could see the screen on okay all right thank you Okay. we spoke about the, these things like um, how do you frame a command what are the three parts of a command correct uh, the, the command itself the options that goes there and the arguments right i'll show you a few more commands okay i have a linux terminal with me i'll just execute a few more commands and show you okay so i'm right now in home ec2 user is the folder that i'm currently in okay uh, but if i were to go uh, just a quick refresher five minutes and then we'll get back to our track uh, what is forward slash it goes to the root okay yeah it took me to the root right and in the root you can do a list of the contents of the root ls but if you want to get a lot more details of the folders and files we can do ls hyphen l a hyphen l is the flag that you can pass yeah so it's going to give me more lot more details about the uh, <clears throat> files that are present in the root okay uh, clear the screen click clear uh, and then what you can do is you can actually go to uh, cd slash home uh, slash ec2 user okay these are uh, some this is the home directory that i have okay instead of doing a cd slash home slash ec2 user what you can do is i'll go back to root i can also do cd tilde cd tilde is actually going to take me to okay right now i have logged in as root i'll come out as root i'll I'll log in as EC2 user. That is my uh, user that I'm currently in, right? So let me go to slash. Okay, I'm right now in 
root with a slash. Okay, so if I were to go go to the home directory, my home directory, what I could do is I can do either cd slash home slash ec2 user, which will take me to my home directory. But I can also do it this way. I can say cd tilde. Tilde is going to take me to my home directory. Okay, so remember these commands and then. Um, okay, let me uh, create some folders here mkdir folder one, mkdir folder two, cd folder one. Okay, I can just do a cd folder one, right? Because I am right now in slash home slash ec2 user, right? Now. Folder one, folder two, both are in slash home slash ec2 user directory, correct? So now, I'm, since I'm here, I can just simply do a cd folder one. Okay, so it will take me to folder one. Or what I can also do is, I'll go back to one folder above. Um, I can also do cd slash home ec2 user folder one. You can give the full path as well. Okay, so this is the absolute path. Sorry, this is the relative path. This is the full path, absolute path. Okay, you can do either way, right? Certain things, what happens, certain times, what happens is uh, when you um, give a uh, running, say, Python uh, programs, or when you run uh, some sort of command line interfaces. Um, using uh, uh, relative path might cause some troubles at times, okay, not always. Okay, at times it, it may cause some trouble. Sorry, just give me a second. It looks like my internet connection is bad. Let me switch to another connection. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, you're audible. Yes, sir. Audible? Yes, sir. Oh, all right, thank yes, you. Sir. So, yes, what sir. I was saying is. Thank you. So what I was saying is at times it becomes difficult to deal with uh, relative paths, right? I mean, it all depends on the path from where, where you're running that program, right? I mean, it is relative to that path, right? If you say that uh, I'm currently in folder, uh, I think my connection was connected. Okay, let me open it. Um, okay, so this is not connecting to my Linux instance. Okay, not a problem. Um, give me a second. Let me again shuffle back, shuffle back to my original network. Sorry, uh, please bear with me for a minute. I'm just fixing an issue with my internet connection.
am i audible now i'm sorry i have some sort of a weird yes, uh, issue with resolving my uh, linux instance uh it's not able to do it from the other connection that i have i need to fix it uh, but yeah just just let me know if my voice um gets scrambled in the middle uh i'll i'll try and repeat whatever i was trying to say okay okay all right so um i'm i'm right now in my home directory which is home slash ec2 user okay uh, and i have got two folders folder one folder two so what i was saying is you you need to understand you know when to use a relative path when to use an absolute path right an example of that is uh, folder one okay i'll i'll go into folder one and i'll create a new file there <clears throat> i will say vi uh folder one file one dot txt just to name it a bit sensible okay uh this is folder one file one something like that yeah just i'll say this okay and uh, then what i do is i'll list it okay perfect i have the file here i'll go back to one folder uh i'll just do a lsfnl if you see two folders so now uh, say you want to uh, uh you know know the contents of this file right so all of you would have done cat right cat is a command uh which will list the contents of a text file or any file for that matter right so you can say cat at since you are currently in the root which is slash home slash ec2 is of the home directory of um the user right and and folder 1 is present with an ec2 user you can do a cat folder 1 slash whole whole 1 file file1.txt you can do this this is going to print the contents of the file okay i can also do it this way cat dot folder 1 okay uh, okay so dot will work you know when you have a file the folder okay i'll do that so you can also do it this way cat slash home slash ec2 user slash folder 1 slash folder 1 file1.txt this is a full path this is a relative path and this is this is the full path that you can basically use right and you do this it also prints the same file right so know this difference so that you know you'll be able to handle the situation when certain times when you write shell scripts or when you write python programs or command line interfaces uh, this may not work as expected okay so you'll have to know this difference okay let me go into folder 1 i'm in folder 1 right now i'll clear the screen uh in folder 1 i have one file okay so now if i if i have to uh print the contents of this file i can just say cat okay uh i i can also do it this way i can i can also say dot slash okay so um okay so the way it works is what is dot dot is the current directory okay so now when you run shell scripts okay you uh, end, end up using this dot quite a few times okay i'll come to that uh, you know when i actually run shell scripts okay but this is this is what we learned yesterday okay and also we looked at several other commands yesterday uh, i'm sure all of you would have tried out all these commands ls cp uh, mv uh, vi okay vi i'm not sure how many of you are familiar with vi okay vi is one of the most popular editors in linux okay uh, many people like vi many people don't like vi um honestly i like vi i love vi but there is also an equivalent of vi that you have which is a lot more friendly okay in vi uh, everything works like a command in vi right okay uh, there are shortcuts to v in in the Uh, VA editor. So when I say VA file one file one dot txt, 
you you get this file but this this won't be in an ed editable mode okay the one that you get usually typically when you open files on your laptop or desktop or on your computer using notepad or textpad you'll be able to edit those files correct but by default when you open vi and you open a file in vi the file will not be editable right so uh, in order to make it editable you have to press i okay i means insert okay you you'll have to change the mode of the file mode of the editor right when you press i then you get this command on the bottom right insert is the command so then what you can do is you can actually edit the file uh, you can make all necessary changes and there there's 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 a lot of shortcuts that va offers right in fact system administrators a lot of people love to use va on their day to day operations okay uh, and and there's also a cheat sheet available for va okay i'll show you the cheat sheet just google for it you will get a cheat sheet yeah you will you will get a lot of uh, you know links to basically understand what all modes that are there in va the the mode that va starts in command mode input mode okay and these are all the commands that are available in vi okay uh, and and if you have to save the file you have to press escape first come out of the insert mode or the edit mode press colon q okay so these are the certain commands that you will have to memorize okay uh, first time you won't get it but yeah you you'll have to memorize and keep memorizing so then you will basically get a hang of these commands right so when you say colon q exclamatory you will exit the file uh, and similarly if you do a w q exclamatory you are saving the file and exiting okay yeah so you are saving the file and exiting okay so va is one i will uh, basically uh, uh, you know let you guys uh, you know dive deep more on vi editor and uh, you can uh, look at some examples that are available for va start practicing these commands more and more okay that's that's what that is a key to use va successfully because va will be there in almost every linux version okay if you know va you know you don't need any other editor right you will love va so much okay but it has got its own downsides such as uh, less i mean i mean a lot of people find it difficult to deal with va there's there's an alternative that is there for that which is called nano okay uh, nano is another editor which is there you can install nano editor uh, uh, i mean it, it by default it does not linux doesn't ship with nano editor but you can install nano editor and you can use nano editor uh, uh, i mean if you are able to install software uh, i'm able to install i will install uh, nano editor here yum install nano okay i'm just going to install okay i think it it already has got nano in it uh, so let me say nano file1 folder1.txt one yeah so this is again a gnu um, gnu software nano uh, this is very good i mean you don't have that uh, um, difficulty of switching modes like va so in nano you can just go ahead and straight away start editing like how you do it in a notepad then just do a control x you'll be, you'll be able to exit the file okay and if you have any changes to be made it will ask you whether to save it or not okay so now just remember that so let me go back ch mod uh, okay ch mod is another um, uh, big thing okay so where in in linux every file you can control the permission of every file okay so um, in in linux what the way it works is the file system works is uh, even folder is considered as a file okay unlike windows okay in windows a folder is a folder right because uh, windows windows basically uh, the file system works that way but in linux 
uh, a folder is also considered a file okay? but it's a special type of a file which can contain other files okay so that's that's the way the file system works in linux right so now ch mod is nothing but it, it with ch mod you'll be able to change the permissions of a file okay for example okay um so when i do ls hyphen l i get so many uh, fields so much so many details associated with it correct uh, so has anyone uh, 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 you know uh, you, out of curiosity try to figure out uh, you know what these fields are what they look like maybe uh, i'm not talking about folks who know linux already maybe uh, you can give opportunity for the ones the newbies who are learning linux and uh, did, if someone tried to dive deep into this some, somebody would like to take a shot at it please do that what are these fields we write uh, we are giving permissions like read and write operations for that file mm -hmm. okay all right and uh, now what are what are all these fields refer to this one and then after that there is a number here there is ec2 user a user name uh, and then date of course is there okay let's look at what those are okay <clears throat> the number one indicates uh, login users okay and the ec2 user is the owner of the file mm -hmm. okay and ec2 user is the group of the this? group of the file group member okay excellent and then and that is date 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 and uh, month okay right. and that is time that, that is that is time that's time no no that is memory what memory i size mean uh, file uh, yeah size uh, size of the file okay very very good and this is the date date and what I, sort of date it is that time, is sorry, what time a gmt time maybe uh, true but what what does that specify is it the created time med, modified time or what is it that is maybe system date time no no true created it time. could be system date time but what is it is it a created time or modified time file modified time modified time sir created okay. time okay it is okay let's see let's look at how to read this okay i'm just going to point you to some resources okay how do we make this this is coming in the way okay i'll just drag it to the bottom for me okay i'll put it here okay all right um yeah okay i'm just also the reason why i'm doing this searching is so that you know you also understand you know how do you search for resources on the internet right and how do you basically narrow down on the right resource to basically do do further reading okay so okay so i'm just trying a few further trim it down 
ls hyphen l explanation Okay. Okay. So if you see here, uh, so this is this is one example of um, what what your ls hyphen l command gives you. Okay. So let's come from the right side. Uh, uh, right side is you have name. Okay. Let me zoom it in a little bit. On the leftmost, you have the name, name of the file. Uh, then you have the modified uh, date and time. Uh, then you have the size, the size of the file in bytes. Okay, it's always represented in bytes. And in ls command, you can also make it a lot more readable, right? So, for example, if you see here, we know the first file uh, is 1024 bytes, okay, which is 1 KB, okay. Uh, that is fine. That's easy to uh, comprehend. That's easy to understand. But if you see the fourth file, audio dot wave, it is four five two five four eight seven six. Correct. It's quite how, how many millions? It's forty five million bytes. Okay. Uh, it's it's quite difficult to uh, understand that, right? So what you can also do is you can uh, play around with the ls hyphen l command by passing additional parameters or flags to it to make this more readable. It will tell you it is 452 GB. I, I guess it is 452 GB. It will say that it will it, give you in GBs and TBs or MBs. Okay, uh, so that you know, it's a lot more readable. And um, the next column is root. Okay, root is the group. Um, as, as, as she said, you know, it is the group of the user that the user belongs to, right? In Linux, you can create groups and you can add users to those groups, right? And then uh, the next one is the actual username, which is the owner of that file, okay? Uh, okay, then the other one is number of links, okay? I think somebody said uh, uh, ID, correct? Uh, okay, it is not ID, it is number of links, okay? Links means, okay, in Linux, you know, what you can do is you can, link a file, uh, uh, you know, to point to a different location, right? So that, you know, for example, I have installed some software, okay, on my box, and then it is, my software is presently lying in my home directory, okay, uh, which is slash home slash uh, prasanna slash software one, okay? And so under that, I have got a, my utility, okay? I'll just say uh, uh, some Java file, okay? But, you know, I want, uh, that to be linked to my bin directory, okay, slash user slash bin or slash s bin, right? You can actually create a link of that file and then so that, you know, it'll it'll get linked to a different directory and then it'll be referenceable from there as well. But the original file is present in this directory, but it will be linked there, okay? Uh, and then uh, you have, this is basically the access uh, modes, okay? Where I, we will dive deep on that a little more on what does that mean, right? And when you say ch mod, you can say 777-400, right? So many modes in which you can use ch mod with, right? When you say ch mod 777, it means that you're giving full access to the file. When you say ch mod 400, you're restricting the access to the file, things like that, okay? Um, and, uh, yeah, and then um, if you see this one, right? This, this, uh, you know, D, the last one, what is the type of that file? As I said, in Linux, everything is a uh, file at the end of the day, correct? Uh, every every uh, object is considered as a file. So that's why if you, if you have got the complex directory structure and when you count the number of files in it, even directories are considered as files in Linux, in Linux file system. Okay, so now this is one thing for, for you all to kind of just search and then start uh, reading on some of these things. But what we will do is I'll go on to the CH mod. Uh, okay, I'll just do some 
uh, basics of how ch mod works that is important sorry So CH mod, what does CH mod mean? Okay, CH mod is change the mode of the or, or an object, right? That is what CH mod means, right? In Unix or like operating system, the CH mod is used to change the access mode of the file. The name is an abbreviation of change mode, okay? Uh, and if you see, these are all the, um, um, these are all the, uh, uh, the, the references with which, you know, you can, uh, um, uh, you know, use uh, identify a certain specific uh, uh, file. Okay, so where uh, if it is you, uh, class is called owner. It, it is the files owner. Okay, G is group. Uh, basically, users who are members of the files group. O is others. Users who are neither the files owner nor members of the files group. A is all of the above. Okay. Okay. So now um, what we can do is I'll just show you a few. Okay, so now here, if you see, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, there are ten characters here. Okay. And you have RW, RW, hyphen R, hyphen, hyphen, right? So let's understand, you know, how do we interpret that, right? So now, uh, if you see, there are three modes in which, you know, permissions actually apply, okay? Uh, first one is read. R is read, permission to read the file. Uh, w means permission to write or delete the file. Uh, X means permission to execute the file, okay? Or in the case of directory, search it, okay? Okay, so now in, in Linux, you know, you have an ability to granularly, you know, define the permissions that a file can have, uh, where you, you may allow somebody to read a file, but you may not allow somebody to execute that file, want some user to execute that file. Okay, so now uh, that's, that's, that's the way, because if, if it is an executable, uh, and I want to basically restrict certain users from executing that file, let me give you an example, right? Say I have built a program, uh, which will uh, um, which will basically uh, talk to a database and it will fetch um, the credit card information of my customers. Okay, it's a, it's a very simple program. Okay, I've just written so that it talks to a database and it get, fetches the credit card information. So now the program it's, is itself a very uh, um, you know, uh, confidential thing, right? Because it is fetching some data which is highly confidential in nature, right? So I don't want somebody to, uh, anyone to, to kind of go execute this program, fetch the credit card details and misuse them, right? So I want to restrict it. So that way you can actually, ex uh, you know, restrict the execute permissions of that particular file, right? And in such a way that uh, only certain administrator groups or only a certain groups will be able to, uh, you know, execute it, okay? So now let's further dive deep into what it means, okay? So now if you see here, let us take a look at the above figure to make things easy, okay? To understand some columns and rows eliminated or added to the permission column to make it easier to read as shown below, okay? So now these are all the files that are there, okay? Okay, and these are all some files and these are all some directories that are there, right? D means directory, right? So that's a type of a file, right, as I said. Okay, so now the very first column represents the type of the file. Uh, the, the very first column represents the type of the file. Um, that is, is it a normal file or a directory where D represent a direct directory and hyphen represents a normal file. Okay, fair enough, that is fine. 
So in this case, there are four files and there's one directory. Okay. Okay. So now let's come to the next one. The first three letters after the file type tell what the owner of the file have permission to do. Okay. Uh, what the owner of the file has got the permission to do where, uh, for example, in uh, assign one client dot C uh, has owner's permission as read and write, which, which means the owner Mike can only read and write, but cannot execute because the third one is basically execute, right? RWX, which you see here, RWX, header dot SH, uh, Mike will be able to read, write, and also execute, okay? Um, uh, and, and, and the third and fourth columns represent the name of the owner of the file and the group to which the owner belongs respectively. Okay, this one. Okay, okay. So now wait, let's, let's actually, I want to also explain this part to you. Okay, let's see whether we get the complete explanation here. Okay, so now if you see here, uh, this first three belongs to the owner. The next three belongs to the group of the, the file that uh, the file belongs to. And the last three belongs to others. Anyone else, you know, who is apart from the owner or the group, right? Anyone else, right? So that's, that's, that's how, you know, you basically represent this. The first three, read, write, execute then uh, it has only read and execute no write permission then read and execute no write permission for others this is for the group uh, this is for all others and this is for the owner himself right the owner of the file in this case is mike okay so now uh, let's go into change mode uh, you know where uh, what change mode does, right? With with change mode, you basically change mode, you can give it as uh, 777, which will give permissions of the files to everybody. Okay, RWX to owner, RWX to group, RWX to all the others. Okay, uh, let's let's see how it works. And let's, let's take an example of uh, how that uh, basically looks like. Okay. So now, okay, so let's change the assign one client C permission so that the owner cannot write in the file, but can only read it. Okay, so now, um, so you have um, uh, CH mode U equal to R, okay, uh, assign underscore client dot C. Okay, so now before, what was the uh, thing? Um, so before we executed this command, it had, uh, the, the owner had uh, read and write, okay, um, uh, which is which is the mic had both read and write, but he didn't have execute. But after you executed this, if you see, um, uh, owner has only, read okay he doesn't have write okay and he doesn't have uh, uh you know uh execute for anyways he didn't have execute permissions okay so now let's simplify this a little more Okay, this is a little neat in terms of explaining it. Okay, so um, yeah, I'll actually paste this. Uh, maybe you can read it post the session today. Okay, this is this is quite good. So now, uh, if you see here, here it clearly explains uh, the who portion of it, right? Where U is user, G is group, O is others, 
uh, a meaning all all of the above okay so now uh, if you see um, when i when i want to apply uh, ch mod let me zoom it in a little bit ch mod u is u as a owner okay ch mod uh, u equal to r w others and group will have only read okay so now let us do that in the example that i have okay um so okay so in this in this example um what i have is um the the owner i am the owner of the file so i have i, I don't have execute permissions uh the group doesn't have execute others don't have write permissions others have only read permissions okay so now let me go ahead and modify that i will say ch mod uh, u equal to uh, r w x others and group equal to r okay uh, i'll say file see this now see uh, i i am the owner of this file and the ec2 user i have got read write and execute others and group has only uh, read they don't have execute you see this i have read write execute others have only read no write and execute uh, sorry a group has no write and execute others have no write and execute only read and this is a file okay so uh, i are you all able to understand this or i can put it in a notepad and show you i'll put it in a notepad i'll explain this okay okay so the first character will be either hyphen or directory okay if it is d it will be directory okay in this case hyphen so leave that part that is the first character the second will be um it will have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 so now what does that mean right this belongs to the owner owner of the file okay i'll just call it owner o this belongs to the group this belongs to others okay so now for the owner of the file uh, it, it can either be read write execute group it can be read write execute others it can be read write execute okay so now i want to change the permissions of a file what i will do i'll i'll say ch mod okay u means you so u means you are the one okay g means group o means others okay that is what did we give here u o or g okay you can also combine it so that you know it gets applied across you don't have to do it separate separately in case you want to give everyone all the rights in this case what i can do is i can just go change the permission to u o g i can give the full permissions to everybody u o g equal to read write execute i'll say ls minus l you see this file has got all the permissions read write execute read write execute read write read write execute okay so what i can do is read uh, ch mod u equal to read write g equal to read comma o equal to um i'll say just read read write read write execute uh, or o equal to just read and some file dot txt 
okay so that way when you when you just go ahead and execute it it goes ahead and change it changes the permissions of the file okay so similarly there is also an another way of uh, you know dealing with it right you can say ch mod 400 Okay, what does this 400 mean? Or ch mod triple seven? Okay, so now what 400 means is it removes all the permissions. You see this? You see the difference between these three? Same file. It is the same file, but you see the difference between this, this, and this. What has happened here? It has. um removed all the permissions to everybody so even the owner of the file i don't have right permissions to the file okay let me try let me try writing to the file what are you getting here is unwritable because i don't have access to as a owner even i don't have access to write the file so when i try to save it permission denied error writing permission denied okay so as a owner i myself don't have access to write and execute the file i only can read it as a owner i only can read it i can't do anything so this is basically used to tamper protect okay the reason why i am explaining the ch mod 400 is subsequently next week when we start aws uh there will be keys okay uh, when connect when you are connecting to ec2 instances or when you are connecting uh, using keys right the key keys are nothing but an access to enter into a system right so those keys are encrypted uh, you know files which should not be tampered okay so in order to avoid anybody fiddling with the file avoid uh, you know anybody tampering the file you can say chmod 400 and that particular key it will stop uh, you know any any access to anybody only the even the user who is currently logged in will have the owner will have only uh, read access to that file okay similarly there are more ch mod like 777 so ch mod 777 let's see what it does yeah what does it do 777 it gives full access to everybody yeah it gives full access read write execute to users group and others it, it gives full access to everybody okay so similarly there are other other things um, I, i'm not going to go to the nth level but uh, you you what you have to understand is you know these are some of the basics because when you <clears throat> when we actually start aws labs if you're not able to connect to an ec2 instance uh, using a key okay you will get an error something like this so at that point in time you have to go modify the uh, file permission uh, and restrict the file permission in such a way that you are able to connect to the instance okay this will be a very common thing that you need to understand so just remember that and you can practice this you can uh, do lab sessions and you can practice this uh, later sometime today okay ch mod is that then you would have done mk dir rm dir c cd uh, remove a file man and yes we spoke about man okay okay all right so let's sir according to the vi things. sir vi um did you try vi yes sir when you say you couldn't get what do you mean by you couldn't get can you explain oh, yeah, that a little more yeah you you have explained right now sir vi so i couldn't understand mm -hmm. VA. Sorry, your voice is too low, people. Yeah, sir. Right now you can hear me. Sir. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So uh, you have explained VI right now, no, sir. Before this yep. change mode. Mm -hmm. So that at that time I couldn't understand what is VI. Okay, VI is an editor. Like you have TextPad, right? Like Notepad you have in Windows, correct? Yes, sir. See, Linux is Linux is uh, is popular for its terminal. Okay, not for its user interface. Okay. okay. Uh, hardly uh, nobody uses the user interface or the desktop of Linux, right? So it same like Notepad in the Windows, sir. Ah, uh, it is same like similar to Notepad in Windows, but Notepad has got a graphical user interface, right? 
and it is mm. lots more friendly user friendly whereas vi does not have a graphical user interface it has a terminal like looking right where i'll show you i say vi see this is this is how this is the editor that you get okay, okay. Uh, so where you will have to you can use vi to search you can use vi to edit files and you can use vi to save files okay vi is just oh, an it's editor to talk it's talk a there. command line editor correct it's a terminal based editor okay okay but the most important thing in vi is you'll have to use commands here like for example right now it is in a it is not in an editable mode when you open the file it won't be in an editable mode you have to you know make it an editable file okay a editable mode so switch to edit mode which says insert okay that's that's what it, it means insert means you can insert i can add more content i can add more uh text to this file okay uh and then what you can do is um you have to come out of the edit mode by pressing escape okay it will come out of the edit mode then you say colon w q exclamatory okay and then it will save the file and enter press enter it will save the file okay i'll okay. say cat yeah you see whatever i added i can add more text to this file it is coming now so uh, you you can learn uh, vi editor okay um, there are youtube videos available for that just learn vi editor because learning vi editor will be quite useful right you will be able to basically uh, work with any linux flavor right and as an alternative i said that you know instead of vi if you are not comfortable with the vi editor you can use nano okay nano is also an ed editor which ships with a lot of linux flavors if not you can install the nano editor okay you can say you say nano yeah this you can you can use it like a notepad okay but you will not get a close window on file hit file save and all that you won't get uh, still it's a, it's a terminal based but it's a little better than uh, vi editor so you'll be able to uh, you know uh, make it a, use use lot more user friendly features with nano editor okay okay sir okay all right um okay. pipes okay uh, redirecting pipes is something that i'll we can we can look at it now okay so now usually in linux what you have is when you have caret symbol right or greater than symbol uh, greater than symbol pipe and these are all uh, you know um, which which you can which you will use very frequently okay so now say for example i am doing ls hyphen l right i'll clear the folder i'll clear this thing i'm saying ls hyphen l so what is ls hyphen l doing it is listing the contents of the file correct contents of the folder so now I, what i what if i want to list the contents of the folder into a file itself into another file itself what i can do is ls hyphen l greater than what greater than symbol means is whatever is the output of this right what is the output of this the output of this is all all of this the command output is all of this that i have highlighted here correct uh, i can basically redirect that entire output to a brand new file or an existing file okay so now in this case what i can do is i can say output dot txt so when you enter this you won't see anything on the screen because all that output that the command is supposed to return has actually gone into this output dot txt has gone into this folder has gone into that particular file okay so now let us see what that file contains okay if you see it has created a new file called output.txt which was not existing before right so now let's see what is there in the output.txt i'll say cat output.txt yeah see cat output.txt has got this as the contents okay let me say nano output.txt so you see okay so now this through this and then you can make use of this to enumerate files right and if you're writing a small program right and you want to basically fetch fetch all the logs files log files from the uh, 
uh, directory and then you want to concatenate all the log files or you want to iterate through every log file and you want to basically uh, uh, merge send send it to another system right you can do several things using this right but but the idea here is to basically uh, redirect the output of any command to a file okay that is what it means or it can also be uh, you know you can use it in conjunction uh, with uh, the output of a certain command can be an input of another command so that is also possible okay you can also do that okay so that way the pipes are quite useful and you can uh, know you know how pipes actually work okay um yeah so now uh, i i told you about uh, you know greater than symbol right uh, so now you can also do a less than symbol okay what is less than symbol less than symbol is you can use a file as an input to a command okay when you say less than symbol you can use file as an input to the command okay so now wc i'm not sure how many of you are aware of wc wc is a word count okay wc means word count i'll just say man wc yeah see wc is a word count uh, program in now uh, uh, in in linux okay so with with wc you'll be able to um uh you know uh, count uh, you know byte counts for each file word or byte counts for each file right that's what wc does so now in this case uh, what it does is uh, it is taking input as a input for the wc command okay input is a file probably that file has got some numbers in it or text in it uh, where it is it is actually trying to count the number of words so basically uh, uh, input when you whenever whenever you use less than symbol it you can it's the other way around you you are passing the input to that command instead of instead of redirecting the output you are redirecting the input to a command okay okay this is again another interesting thing so where um i i want to understand you know how many processes are running okay uh what in windows what do you do okay in windows you right click the task bar and you you say task manager and you go to the task manager it will show you all the processes that are running right but in linux there is a command called ps okay uh, the ps command will basically tell you uh, how many processes are running so i'll just say man ps yeah report a snapshot of the current processes okay um, so that's that's what ps does and there are so many options that ps has got okay i'll just show you an example of it okay uh, so in this case i want to understand uh, how many processes are running right i'll just say hit just ps uh, right now it is showing uh, two processes right so one is the bash itself bash is this process right i've i've connected as through ssh to uh, the linux server that itself is is the bash and it, it has got a process id to it okay 15011 is a process id and i just ran ps right that will also run as a process behind the scene right so now that uh, you know it it has a process id to it 15361 because every every pro process that runs in linux has got a process id i can say ps minus ef okay it will list all the processes that are running on all the users okay if you see these many processes are actually running in my linux server okay so you have uh, uh, you know this is the user id which, which is running that process this is the process id um and uh, and this is the command that uh, that executed that process okay i'll just show you some examples here
yeah if you see this root 1975 okay so now if you see this is the path of that command which is running as a process in this case slash user slash lib slash system d slash system d hyphen journal d okay so now the process id is 1975 and it is running as a process within my server similarly there are so many processes that are running okay uh, yeah crony so crony d is a um is a time server okay uh, ntp protocol it is it is it is it is used to set the time of my system right so that is running as a process right uh, so like that you'll see a lot of and and this is this is an amazon ec2 instance amazon has put some process in it right amazon ssm agent that is running here okay ssh the ssh is the i've connected as an ssh correct so that ssh d is also running as a process which is interacting with me right i am interacting with that ssh i am interacting with this particular process when i run commands on the terminal okay uh, and then uh, yeah and then the ps i just ran ps iphone ef right that itself is running as a process if you see 15362 is the process sorry 15363 is the process and i am the ec2 user i am running it as a process okay uh, so now let us do one thing okay let's just uh, see how how do i filter on the processes that i'm looking at right so for example i want to see ssh i want to filter by only ssh all the processes that are running only ssh okay so now how do i filter those okay so now let me clear the screen i ran ps iphone ef right ps iphone ef put up pipe pipe symbol okay pipe symbol is is very very useful and you can uh, use pipes uh, to basically separate the stages of your command okay so now in this case uh, i'm i'm doing ps iphone ef and then i'm putting a pipe uh, grep okay again I, i'm not sure how many of you are aware of grep uh, if you are from computer science background if you have done labs in the past you know what grep is okay um so can somebody tell me what grep is in linux it is used to search the files with the help of different patterns excellent perfect so grep is to search something with a help of regular expressions okay so now um those who are not from computer science background don't worry okay regular expression is very very important okay you can learn regular expressions which will help you in multiple ways okay i'll i'll give you some points some resources to learning regular expressions you can try it out you can try it out at your leisure time what regular expressions are okay um yeah um yeah go to this okay uh, understand what regular expression is see regular expression is nothing but you have a string okay a string is nothing but a text object correct so you have a string within that string you want to basically search using some patterns okay i want to uh, I, i want to say for example search uh, you know uh, uh, i i live in hyderabad okay that's the text that i have right uh, i want to search uh, you know any uh, text that has got hyderabad in it okay so what i can do is i can i can wrap it with a regular expression which says that search any content that has got hyderabad in it any file that has got hyderabad in it so and then you run the grep using this regular expression it will search all the files that has got hyderabad in it okay it will be it will be very simple uh, it's just that you need to understand and see you know how do you make use of it i'll also give you this link go through this um so uh, so basically grep is again a uh, command <clears throat> 
which which can search files or so which can search content okay so forget about this 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 part i'll come back later but right now you know let's keep it simple so what i'm going to do is um ps iphone ef is throwing me that entire list of all the processes that are running under several users right i want to grab one which has only ssh in it okay if you see uh it filtered the results which has got only the text ssh in it okay so it first what it what it did what it uh, does it first ran psi for ef uh, then you know you can actually um, group multiple commands using the pipe symbol okay that is what um, you know um, that is what the pipe means right so where pipe means you can separate multiple stages using pipe of the same command of one command basically not the same command it can be multiple commands okay then what i'm doing is the output of this is actually uh processed by this grep using the pipe symbol uh, where uh, i'm i'm simply not redirecting the output but i'm processing that output and then and then what i'm doing is i'm grepping on the output <coughs> for the word ssh in it using the pipe symbol whereas i'm where in this case i'm actually staging my uh multiple commands in one single execution okay using the pipe symbol okay so that way this will be very very useful i mean you want to say search for um, say you are running a java program right or you are running some python program right so you want to say how many javas running how many java processes are running okay uh, right now there are no java processes running okay this is the grep command itself see that is the beauty of linux right i mean if you see uh, i have how many when i grepped for ssh how many results did i get i got 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 31 32 33 34 35 36 37 38 39 40 41 42 43 44 45 46 47 48 49 
Okay. Good morning. Sorry, somebody was saying A zero for you was saying something. Sir, it is an IP address network. I think so. Uh, okay. No, it is not a okay. IP address something or different. I'll explain that a little later. Okay. A, a lot of others that you Ping said. Ping is uh, nothing but uh, right? it is a minimum. Ping is a speed of network that we connected particular. The minimum time like with time to which takes uh, to process a request from the net internet. Okay, partially right, but what is ping? Ping is basically a <clears throat> network utility. Will, uh... Yeah, I'll explain that. I'll explain that. Please, <laughs> all of you go on mute. I can explain that. Um, so ping is basic. Sorry, Z zero nine zero. You have to go on mute, please. Okay. So ping is uh. Uh, ping is a network utility. It, it comes as part of the operating system. Uh, where ping with ping, you know what you can do is you can send a uh, you you can send a packet to the other computer, other IP address. You'll you'll usually use IP addresses in ping. You can also use DNS entries in the ping. But what you are trying to do is you are sending a test packet to the other computer on the network or on the internet to see if that is able to respond or not. Okay, so what ping does is it does a round trip. It sends packet and it receives the packet from the other computer. Okay, usually ping works on a ICMP protocol. Okay, uh, it's called ICMP. Uh, you can read about it a bit little later. But, uh, it's called ICMP protocol, so where it sends the data, uh, sends a packet, a test packet. It's like checking heartbeat, right? Uh, I'm, I'm just sending a heartbeat to something. So just to check, you know, if, if I'm able to get a response back or not, okay? It's like that, nothing else. It does not transfer any data. It does not send any real data to the other computer. It just sends a test packet, sends, receives the response back. Uh, through the virtue of it, it checks what is the round trip between the source computer to the destination computer. Okay, that is what ping does. Okay, so now I can actually ping uh, google.com. Okay, have you ever tried pinging google.com? Will it work? Okay, let's try. I'm pinging google.com. Yeah, see, it works. Actually, it works. Okay, so now it works. Um, so what google.com is doing is it's, it's actually resolving to some IP address on the internet, correct? So this is the IP address that uh, resolves to google.com, this google.com. And this is the um, fully qualified domain name of the google.com from where it is, from the computer which, it's, which is returning that, okay? And then you, you get this time, right? Somebody said, mentioned about time also. It's partially right. It tells me what is the time it took. Okay, for a test packet to be sent and brought back, right? In this case, it sent 64 bytes. Okay, it sent 64 bytes from this computer, from this server, okay? 10, 0, 1, 170, 172 to google.com. And then it took about 465 milliseconds to come back. Okay, less than a second, half a second. It took to get the response back from google.com, okay? So now that is what it says. I mean, whenever you want to troubleshoot issues, whenever you want to, uh, you're not able to connect to some server over the network. You can do a ping and see, I mean, provided, uh, you know, it is, ping is allowed on the destination server, right? It's, it's like this. I'll just do a quick whiteboarding and show you how it works. This is your source server. This is your destination server. Okay, and between the source and destination server, you are basically um, 
sending some data and you uh, receive data back correct that's how network communication happens right so this passes over the network okay this goes over the network okay this goes over the network uh, you are sending some data and you are receiving back some data correct so now um what uh, what actually happens is uh, it 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 needs to know the ip address of the destination right so now in this case the ip address of the destination let's assume 192.168.1.10 is the ip address of the destination okay and my ip address of the source is One dot, let's say five. Is this source and destination is one dot ten, right? So now my, uh, I'm, I want to understand, you know, if I'm able to send. So now, if this is what my source is and this is my destination is, and my source wants to transfer some files to destination, and it is not able to connect for some reason, you can do a ping and check, okay? Because the connectivity could be either due to network issues, or uh, within the uh, destination. Uh, there is a program which is running okay there is a program that is running which is accepting there is an application which is running which is accepting files to come from source to destination that program could have crashed okay that program could have crashed that program is no longer running okay that program could have crashed so because of that it is not able to accept the data being sent from source to destination the file being sent from source to destination okay that program could be an ftp server okay ftp server which is running on the destination that program could have crashed but network is fine so in that case when you ping from source to the destination at a network level at least you know that there is no interruption the network is fine the target server is also fine it is able to at a network level it is able to interact with uh, the other systems other computers in the network okay uh, but probably then you know then you basically it's like pe peeling the layers of onion right so then you know that okay so then the problem is with the sftp server so that way you understand and you will be able to understand that uh, scenario much better right so now but the only thing is that uh, you, on the destination side the ping should be enabled on the source on the destination server Okay, when I say ping is enabled, uh, the ports required for ping needs to be opened. Uh, protocols that are required, ICMP protocol, as I said, needs to be enabled on the destination. Usually, it will be enabled. If it is enabled, you will be able to ping the destination. You will be get able to get the response back from your destination. And this is ping is used in many different scenarios for doing health checks, as I said, right? From source to destination, I want to do a health check of my destination. You can do a continuous ping of the destination, and uh, you can. use that response to know that your destination is healthy and you, you can send the data from source to destination okay so that way ping is very useful okay so now you can do you can do ping of anything right okay i mean i mean i can do a ping of uh, uh let's say i have i have another server in my network okay um um okay let me just check what what servers do i have i've got a few more servers here okay it can be an Thing. it can be ping of um, amazon.com if you see uh, it can be ping amazon.com also so amazon.com is returning 
from some IP address, from some public IP address. Okay. So, uh, and it can also be for a private IP address, right? And I'll say ping 10.1.20.50. Um, I mean, it's just a random private IP address that I'm taking. I mean, right now this does not exist. Okay, I'm just taking some random. It does not exist. So I'm just saying ping to that. So it won't return anything. It will time out. If you see, it will time out. It's not pinging, which means that it is not able to send anything. It's not able to find the destination on the network. Uh, either the destination does not exist or the destination is not responding. So these can be two primary reasons why ping doesn't work. Okay. If you see 100% packet loss, it tried sending 26 packets. Okay. And 100% packet loss. Uh, every second it was trying, trying to send one packet of 64 KB, 64 bytes. Okay. And if you see here, nine packets transmitted, nine received. 0% packet loss, which means uh, there is no disruption between the source and the destination on the network. So both are healthy, right? Source is healthy, destination is healthy, and the network is also healthy. Okay, and then it sent nine packets, it received all the nine packets. So in this case, 26 packets were sent, zero were received. Okay, so ping is going to be very important. Learn ping uh, and you can uh, try doing ping. It, it is also available in Windows. You can just open a command prompt in Windows and you can do a ping, okay? Similarly, Telnet, okay? Telnet is, uh, how many of you know how many of you worked with Telnet or used Telnet in your past past, uh, past uh, um, um, colleges or any any other learning sessions that you had? Okay, nobody knows about what Telnet is, right? Okay, so. What is Telnet? Telnet is a utility uh, which is available in both Windows and Linux. Telnet is used to uh, log into a remote machine on a specific port okay, just to check, I mean, if it works fine or not. You won't be able to transfer any data using Telnet. Similar to ping, right? I mean, ping also, you won't be able to transfer any real data to the destination server. But it's a utility which allows you to check the health of the destination server. Similarly in Telnet, Telnet is a simple utility which allows you to log into a remote host machine uh, using a specific port. Okay, so again, port is, what is a port? A port is nothing but, um, let me give an example, right? you have a railway station okay and uh, typically railway stations have mm, multiple platforms correct and uh, uh, consider a platform as a network oh, sorry can consider the track as a network uh, and you have stations as computers as different computers or different servers in the network, correct? That's how, see in real world also, you see a lot of networks, right? Other than computer networks. You see a lot of real world networks like railway is a network. It's, it's, the, it's the largest network in India, right? We, are, we should be proud of it. In fact, it's Indian railways is, is the largest rail network in the world, okay, by the way. So, uh, so you have your uh, uh, your multiple cities, right? And each or multiple villages or multiple places, towns, they've got railway stations in it, right? And they're all connected to each other through tracks. Okay, there are thousands of kilometers of tracks running across the country today, right? You can consider that as the network that is running, the network cables that are running across the country for, in the telecommunication world. And you have railway stations. Consider railway stations as the um, 
as the computers as the various different servers okay there are thousands of railway stations in the country today correct so uh, uh, or or tens of thousands of railway stations <laughs> i don't know the actual figure probably it's good to know how many railway stations are there in india but tens of thousands of railway stations in india so right consider each railway station as a computer in the network in the large network and the network is connected through tracks okay and uh, consider trains as the data which is trans transporting people from one place to other place correct trains run on the tracks they start from one station to another station and then they transport people from one station to another station so in the world of networks computer networks consider uh, trains as the actual data passing from one computer to another computer through the tracks which is through the network okay so now <clears throat> let me come to the point um so when you take major stations or any station for that matter right uh, uh when when trains go and when trains actually stop where do they stop trains stop or halt on a platform correct uh so that platform again uh is basically a medium through which uh you know the train which is carrying the data stops at a platform which allows the passengers to uh get down the train and then they the uh, passengers can aboard the train um, or get into the train or come out of the train and then go to their respective places okay so now uh, imagine without a platform how will passengers get out of the train they can't jump out of the train right you need a seamless mechanism through which you come out of the train so now there are several platforms right you take a, you go to secunderabad station or you go to hyderabad nampalli station there are several platforms in it right there are about tens of 20s of platforms and there are some stations have got more more number of platforms like for example mumbai dadar right or mumbai uh, chennai central station has got so many platforms in it right 20 20 platforms i believe so uh, so now each time it comes on a different platform right you passengers it allows the passengers to get down so similarly in the computer networks uh, consider ports ports as the platform right so where in a computer you have several ports which are waiting for data to pass through it okay similarly here also in 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 the case of in the analogy of railway stations you have platforms which allows passengers to pass through it right similarly in computer networks uh, you have ports in in a computer you have multiple ports in an operating system you have several ports the ports will allow the data to pass through it it's just a medium that's it it does nothing it does no additional things it only allows the data to pass through it so that the application can receive it program can receive it program can process it and it can store it in its database or it can uh, send it to another system or it can simply reject it or it can simply write it to a log file or it can simply uh, uh, push it to a mobile device or do whatever it want right so imagine that way it's so that way a port is something which is running in the computer uh, it, there are so many ports that every operating system has got okay uh, there are multiple ports and there are st standard ports that are there right such as port 22 is used for ssh port 80 is used for http right all the web pages that you see when i hit google.com that is actually running on listening on port 80 on the target computer okay and similarly port 443 is ss uh, uh, you know https a secure http right so that way um, you know ports are you, you can learn more about ports okay i'll send you some links post the session uh, some basic links which are there you can learn how, you know what ports are right what comprises uh, uh, and what are the various different protocols that are there but at least you know you would have understood the analogy that i'm trying to bring here 
between a real world network and computer networks right so that's how it it works port is nothing but it's just a medium through which the data can pass through so now in telnet a telnet is a simple utility which allows you to check whether a target computer is accepting any data through the port or not okay so ping what ping did ping just told me whether the target computer is living or dead correct that's what ping did right i mean if the target computer is living it will return me some data if the target computer is dead like google.com is living right it's giving me data response back whereas this one that i tried is dead it doesn't exist 10 1 20 50 does not exist in the network or either it, if it if it exists it, it is dead okay so it's not giving me any data back so that's what ping does but telnet can do a little more than that telnet can basically go into that particular port and it can tell me whether that port is accepting requests or not okay let's do a simple telnet google.com on port 443 Four four three is for HTTPS, right? So because when you do a Google dot com, when I say when I hit Google dot com, what do I see here? I don't see HTTP. I see HTTPS. Yes, this is a secure protocol. Every packet that goes from my client to the server gets encrypted, right? So similarly, if you see it, if you see, you can see the certificate that it has. The click on the lock symbol, you will see the certificate. so this is the certificate that google has provided which encrypts the data it's called ssl right a lot of you all most of you would have read about ssl as part of your uh, courses academic courses but but you can you will don't worry about it you will learn a lot about this in the coming days so now 443 is the port res- responsible for trans- trans- transferring any data over https right https basically a hypertext hypertext transfer protocol which can which will be able to transfer html pages over the network right it's a special kind of tcp protocol http okay so now i'll say telnet google.com port 443 okay i don't have telnet okay good excellent so let me install telnet sudo yum install telnet please go ahead and install it okay i'm installing telnet okay telnet is available Just doing a see, it is connected. It tried connecting to this on port four four three, and it successfully connected to Google dot com. Okay, I'll try some other port instead of four four three. I will say three three eight nine. It won't be able to connect because the three three eight nine port is not open on the target computer. See, it won't be able to connect. Okay, let me connect. Uh, let me try twenty two port twenty two port twenty two is SSH, right? I mean, this what what the terminal that we are seeing is basically SSH. Okay, that is port twenty two. It won't be able to open because twenty two is not open on the target computer. The only port that is open. Let me try eighty. Right, port eighty is HTTP, correct? Uh, I'll try eighty. Eighty is connected. Okay, only eighty and four four three are connected because. it is a website and uh, and it only allows http traffic to come into that it does not allow any other traffic to go into that okay so that way you know you can use telnet to check the health of a computer uh, on a specific port it it's a little more deep dive right i mean than ping ping will only just tell you at a high level whether the computer is living or dead But here in this case, Telnet will tell you on a specific protocol whether is it accepting traffic or not, whether is it allowing or not. So this will be very important because when you do troubleshooting, all this will come handy. Okay, all this will come uh, quite helpful, and you'll be able to use all of this, all of these network tools. Okay, who is basically again a thing you know where you can say who who else is logged in into this computer. only i am logged in no one else i have got three sessions running because of those two sessions are not closed uh, okay
let me just do a login as root and uh, and then i'll say who okay yeah i mean uh, i've just taken a elevated privilege so it won't show but if i log in as really as root it will be able to tell me okay but if you see uh, these are the only three users who are logged in in fact only one user who is logged in ec2 user who is logged in you can say you can see who all are logged in into that computer you can also talk to somebody in that computer it's just a way to send a message to another user right so for example kiran wants to talk to ram right and you can kiran can say that talk use the talk talk command to send a message to ram they both of them will be able to chat on the network uh, chat on the computer so that's that's what it does okay ftp is again a file transfer protocol uh using ftp you will be able to basically transfer files from one computer to another computer okay uh, again uh, ftp service needs to be running on the destination computer from where you are sending okay uh, and it should be accepting traffic coming from the source computer uh, similar again take the analogy of railway station right say um say a plat railway station has got say 10 platforms in it out of 10 platforms um only one is operational or only two are operational rest of the platforms are closed trains be able to go there trains be able to stop in those platforms no because they are closed for maintenance or whatever it is or they are it be simply you know given in the of networks the computers servers you need a certain ports to be opened so that it can allow communication to pass through without that communication will not pass through okay that's very important so ftp if the target computer has got ftp service running on say port 20 or 22 it will be able to accept traffic coming from the source computers uh so that's that's one and uh, yeah and also uh, do some more things today right i mean we spoke about networking so try the ping command try telnet command okay uh you can try to public websites itself for now right because you don't have two computers each that you can try some public websites do right internet uh google.com give a 440 it will help you um uh, now whether you are able to connect or not okay and also there are um file manipulation is also there right there you you can do uh cat cat is a concatenate program right um so uh, i i showed you how cat works right so cat is basically able to um, print all the contents of the file right on the terminal for viewing more basically a command which you can use to if if say a file is too big to be opened enough i can do a more command less command okay i'll just show you less command that is also useful I'll just say less. Yeah. So less actually, uh, you know, tells me, uh, gives, gives, prints me the file. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say Q Q. It will quit out of the file. Okay. More. Yeah. More works pretty similar to what. Um. Cat. Okay. Take what tail does is it basically takes the last portion of the file and then it just prints it on the screen, right? So now let's do another, uh, you know, experiment with with interesting. I close the window. I just connect to the server.
just I'll go to uh, folder one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then what I'll do is I will do a tail here. So tail, you can pass a option to the tail. Uh, I'll I'll print the text file. Okay. So what it is doing is it is actually waiting for any updates to be made to the file so that those updates can be printed here in real time. Okay. So you can use this when you're troubleshooting certain things, right? So when logs are being printed to the file, uh, you will use tail hyphen F and the file name, and then it will keep printing those additional things. So I'll go to the other tab. I'll open the uh, file here, and then I'll add more text to it. Added more text. And I'll save this. I'll go back to this. See, you immediately got that printed here, added more text. Okay, I'll do it some more times. I'll do it a few more times. Once more, again, once more. I'll just save it. See, once more, again, once more. All of those got printed here, right? So. So that way you can use tail iphone f to constantly monitor that file for any changes and print that additional text in the screen so that way if you have running logs right so when logs are being printed to the file continuously and you're troubleshooting something you can use tail iphone minus f to basically continuously print that on the screen so that you'll be able to know what's happening on the log files you in real time you'll be able to troubleshoot things Okay, that is like tail. Okay, in WC is like count the words. Okay, um, yeah, and and there are other commands that you have, right? You can just Google for these commands and then start learning these commands. Okay, so now that you have a basic grip of, of what what we are trying to do here, so you can just take this up and then start learning some of these. And also, these are certain other things that you can you need to understand, right? Such as grip we spoke about it uh, fold you can just leave it you can learn by yourself tar tar and gzip right so these are again two important uh, commands that you need to know right tar is a <clears throat> archive okay zip we, we know zip right zip files and windows we have zip so similarly tar and zip are like two things that you need to know right so where okay let's do one thing I have a file here. Uh, I have two files here, right? Uh, I can use tar. I mean, let, first of all, let me see if yeah, tar is installed. Uh, what I can do is I can use tar to zip these two into one particular zip file. In Windows, what you do, you select those files, right click and right click, right click and say add to compressed folder, right? It's very simple in Windows, but in Linux, you need to use a command for it, right? So here the command is tar hyphen xbf. Okay, um, star two, so when I say star, all the files in this folder, two uh, zip file dot gz. Okay, that's that's the extension that we, we give, okay. Okay, sorry. Okay, <laughs> x is sorry, extract, uh, x is extract um, to zip. Star star hyphen, hyphen, uh, sorry? Okay, star okay, not uh, ZBF, it is star hyphen CVF. CV is CVF2, CVF is to compress it, C is to compress, okay, star to zip file dot GZ. Okay, let me just look up the command. Okay, tar hyphen PDF example. Uh, okay, first I think the file name should come. Okay, okay, first the file name should come. So basically, zip file dot gz to star. Yeah. So it, I was, I think I flipped it. Okay. So you see, you created a zip file, which has the 
contents of uh, these two files. Right? It is present in the zip file, right? So now let me do one thing. Let me move the zip file to the folder to move zip file to dot dot slash folder two. Okay, so now this doesn't have this. This doesn't have the zip file. So let me move uh, folder to e dot dot slash folder to ls hyphen l. You have the zip file, right? So now let me unzip this, right? So to unzip, it is tar hyphen xvf. X means extracted. C is compress it, okay? I'll say zip file dot gz. Okay, it unzipped these two files in, it, in folder two. See, you have these two files coming into the folder two. You, you took the zip file and then you used it to uh, compress it and then extract it. Okay, so that way uh, tar, uh, something that uh, you all need to practice and uh, practice uh, try a few examples with tar okay pico just ignore it for now you can just leave it okay uh, and uh, yeah few more commands so, so all of this i think we, we can. okay kill is another command that you need to know so if i if i have process right i mean we looked at ps ps hyphen ef so these are all the processes that are running correct Say so I want to basically kill one process. So this is the process that I want to kill. Okay, or let me take some process which does not crash my computer. Okay, okay let me just take this, this itself. Uh, okay, on double five one one. So you will see this process ID. This is the process ID. And you also have one more thing next to that, right? So this is basically the parent process ID. This is the child process ID. Sorry, this is the child. This is the parent. Okay. Now one double five one four is the is a child process of one double five one one. Sorry, one one five zero one one. Okay, one five zero one one is this, right? So this is my parent process ID. This one double five one four is basically a child process of this parent process ID. Okay. So now um, what I can do is I can just kill something. I'll just randomly kill. That's okay. If my session gets disconnected, that's okay. I'll kill, you can say kill hyphen nine. That is that is the pro, uh, you know option that you pass and say one double five one one. Yeah, so if you see that, that process would have got killed. Okay, you're force quitting a process. That is that's why you the process, right? In case a process is not responding, it is stuck in Windows. What you do, you just go to Task Manager, right click and kill end task, right? So it would have killed that process and it again started another process with the same name. What did I kill? I killed one, one, five, five, one, one, right? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, even if I killed, even though I killed it, it again brought up the same process once again because it's a worker process, right? Which has uh which can't be killed and even if it is killed it will come back okay but yeah i mean you can try this i mean just remember this right where uh, you use this to kill processes right you can quit processes and you can kill processes forcefully okay um yeah some of these you can you can just uh, you know try uh, you know working out in your lab session today Okay, uh, so what we'll do is we'll take a pause here and then uh, we can actually start uh, shell programming uh, tomorrow, right? What, 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 what I can do is we can, I can just give you a very basic shell script to be written. You, okay, you can just write those shell scripts. Uh, you can play around with files or you can do whatever you want with shell scripts, right? It's, it's shell script is nothing but, you know, it's a, it's a way where you, um, uh, you write a small program, right? I mean, using shell scripting on Linux, right? Uh, and then using using a bunch of commands that we have we have learned now, right? We have learned a lot of commands to in the, over the last two days, right? So now you want to, uh, you know, orchestrate all of those commands using one script, right? And where you want to perform some operations, perform some actions, you use shell script to basically run these commands in a more structured fashion. All right, and also you can use those shell scripts to automate many things. Right now, I'm interacting 
with my Linux box using a terminal that I have, right? But in many cases, you know, users won't be able to interact with the Linux box, right? I mean, users will use automation to execute things. So those automations will have access to the Linux box. In such cases, using, using shell scripts will be very important to automate a series of tasks, okay? So we'll talk a little more about it in tomorrow's session, right? And uh, we, we will actually finish the uh, introduction to shell scripting tomorrow. And then I'll give you a few examples which you can try out tomorrow. But today, uh, just to recap what all we learned, uh, we learned about, uh, you know, how the permissions work in Linux, okay? And how do you manage those permissions, okay? And then we also learned, uh, uh, using greater than symbol, less than symbol and commands to redirect input or to uh, to redirect the output or to take the input from a file to a command. And we looked at using pipes, okay? Using pipes to create a segments, multiple segments of a command. That's where we saw uh, PS, okay? PS this is a command which will throw all the list of processes that are running. And we did grep on, on the PS output to understand, uh, uh, you know, to filter by certain text based on the process name, okay? Uh, and then we also looked at VA editor, basic VA editor, okay? Then we also looked at some network commands such as ping, telnet, and things like that, okay? so. Do those, I mean, those are very interesting, right? So that will give you idea as to what, how, how networks, how computers talk on networks, right? Uh, and then we also looked at uh, um, how to manipulate files using various other commands such as cat, less, more, tail, right? We looked at, right? Tail and see, you know, how it, how tail behaves. Right, and we also looked at um, zipping. Okay, how do you use, manipulate with zip? How do you zip and unzip files? Right. Um, so what you can do is, I'm I'm not sure how well the the other one that worked. I mean, for you the free Linux server. But what I can propose to you is, you build your own Linux server on your desktops or laptops. Okay. So how do you build your own Linux server on your desktops or laptops? I'm assuming you know you. All of you have at least a four GB of RAM on your desktops or laptops. Okay, if not, uh, either you upgrade your RAM, okay, uh, or or ba basically find a better computer with which can give you more learning opportunities. Okay, so you have something called Oracle VM Box. Uh, Oracle Virtual Box, sorry, not VM, Oracle Virtual Box uh, can um, help uh, students to kind of install this in their, uh, it's it's an open source, okay? Uh, it, it, it can be installed on their laptops or desktops, okay? So you just need to download this Oracle Virtual Box uh, and then you have to run a Linux image on top of it. So that way, what, what it does is, it's a virtualization, right? On top of your physical computer, you're virtualizing it to run a Linux on top of it, okay? It will share the same resources that you have for your lap laptop or desktop, okay? And how many of you tried this in the past using VirtualBox or VMware tools? I tried it. Is any of you aware of it? Have you? Sorry, who yes, sir. I'm also Z034. Z034. Z110. Okay. Have you, have you guys tried VirtualBox? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, no, sir. VMware. Okay. You have tried VMware, right? Okay. Yeah. And use VMware also. VMware. Workstation, no? What did you try? Workstation, is it? Yeah. For VMware yeah, player. Workstation. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a open source. It's free actually. Yeah. VMware workstation is free. Correct. Yes, sir. Yeah. So 
um, what is the specifications of your laptop or desktop? I have a uh, desktop, 8GB RAM. 8GB RAM? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, think, I think with, with even 4GB... Yeah, I think yes, even sir. with 4GB, it should be easy, easily, uh, it should be able to come up in a, even in a 4GB. You just need some additional My disk name. space. Yes, sir. At least yeah. about 20, 30 GB. GB additional disk space is what you need. Okay, even, yeah, somebody said 4GB. So it works fine even in 4GB. So you can My either name. use VirtualBox or VMware Workstation. Okay, what you do is uh, you can basically install this on your laptops or desktops and load an image. Uh, which has Linux in it. You either go for a CentOS, yeah, go for a CentOS Linux in it. Okay, so that you know we are all consistent. Everybody is trying the same. I mean, if you still want to use Ubuntu, you can use those who I heard some people saying that you know they are comfortable with Ubuntu. You can use Ubuntu, but I would suggest for new people, don't go for Ubuntu. Go for a CentOS. Load a CentOS image, and then you'll be able to log into that. And then you, you can uh, basically run the terminal that I, I just ran, okay? Uh, you'll be able to run a terminal like this. And then you'll be able to practice all these commands I said in your own computer, in your own personal computer, rather than, I mean, if you have internet issues or things like that, you don't have to worry about it, but you'll be able to uh, run all of this in your own personal computer, okay? You can try that. Uh, so uh, folks who, have experience with using VMware Workstation or VirtualBox. What I would suggest is uh, you help your other friends to install this on your on their desktops and laptops. Maybe in today's lab session, how many of you um, have uh, have tried this in the past? The VirtualBox, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I tried it. Uh, Z034. Z034. Okay, one second. I'll uh, just just raise your hands. Those who of you who of you tried it in the past. Okay, so that way. Um... Sir, I think so. Yeah. Uh, if we go to Google uh, YouTube. Hello. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we go to YouTube, we'll get we will find some uh, drive links mm -hmm. for downloading this uh, okay. virtual box or virtual machine and uh, uh, this Linux uh, all Ubuntu whatever we want yeah, we can correct. download from there. We'll have direct down di direct download links. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. That that's a good option. I think about 10 to 12 people have raised their hands who can help the rest of the friends. Normally, they will keep uh, keep uh, in their drives in YouTube. Okay, can you can you just help uh, uh, get it set up on everybody's laptop or desktop? At least if maximum of you are able to get it up and running, you know, you can try out these things because next three four days you know you are going to do hands-on exercises with shell scripting and python also okay of course for python you don't need linux completely but yeah if you have linux it's good also what i would request all of you to do is to create an account with aws subscribe like how you did for oracle uh, create an account with AWS. Um, again, you know, you, you have to use your credit cards to create an account with AWS. It There is a free tier available for one year. Okay, you have to read through very carefully on the free tier because 720 wow. hours of one T2.micro instances allowed. If you provision anything above more than that, you will get charged. Okay, or if you use anything above that, you will get charged. So you have to be very careful in uh, using that free tier uh, in a very diligent and uh, judicious fashion so that you know you don't get charged and but that's a great platform for you to uh, start learning aws right and you'll be able to 
actually uh, get your hands dirty with that so you know who is able to go ahead and register using your credit cards or or you can wait till for a couple of days you know i'll what i'll do is i will show you how do you register with it rather than you going and trying out something uh, which will end up in a cost just leave it for now uh, i'll i'll explain you how uh, you know you can register okay and how you can basically use it it's it's free i mean you will just have probably 50 60 rupees of charge the first time but that will get reversed like how you had it for uh-huh. oracle if you use debit card it will charge you only 1 rupee or 2 rupees it also oh, okay 2 rupees right yes. okay okay right That's correct especially yeah. enough for uh, this comments sorry if we if we use dibash that is enough for this session means uh, linux comments sigwin sigwin right dibash dibash yeah you can use that also yeah you can use that that is also fine but yes. if you have a um, you know a full fledged linux running in yeah, your i am already in the laptop VMware so desktop that will be good i am also using vmware workstation okay this is z035 right okay you are using vm workstation yeah that's good uh, just just help out the rest of the team members to install vm workstation on their laptops or desktops okay i think about 10 12 lot people raised raised your hands okay um, so uh, so what i would request is uh, maybe mentors uh, when they get into the uh, breakout session breakout rooms maybe what um, what we can do is uh, they can actually uh, you know install vmware workstation on their laptops or desktops and they can start uh, practicing so with you- that Can you enable this chart? Yeah, I think towards the end of this, you know, we'll have mentors enabling the chat room. I'll post the links. I'll post the links for the download option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, so let's do that. And uh, if if for some reason you are not able to install uh, the VMware workstation. leave it don't worry take it easy uh, you're not missing anything you know we can always catch up on this you can still continue to use your firefox or chrome that free linux server okay uh, you can you uh, use that to practice some of these because that's also a linux at the end of the day it gives a full fledged linux online you can use that to practice uh, if you are able to use vmware workstation or virtual box well and good install that so that you know you can always use it uh, you know irrespective of whether you you are connected to the internet or not um, and eventually when we start learning python and uh, aws it will be useful because using linux is useful i mean it's not mandatory but at the same time using linux will basically complete the learning cycle uh, and uh, yeah and then you know in, in about 2 2 to 3 days time i'll tell you how to register for aws you, you don't have to do it today you, you can just stay wherever you are don't register i will tell you how to register okay and uh, i'll also tell you if there are other options available okay all right uh, so i think uh, we'll we'll take a pause here okay we'll again meet tomorrow Uh, on the shell scripting i'll start shell scripting tomorrow and give you few more exercises on shell scripting but today if you are able to get this done it will be good okay so um i'll i'll then uh, take a leave here and uh, maybe you can get get into your breakout sessions and see if you can um, install the vmware virtual box so guys who raised your hands please help the rest of your team members to install virtual box on their laptops or desktops okay maybe you can uh, each one of you can go into one of the uh, rooms i mean if most of you are in single room maybe i would request and to other rooms and help the rest of the team members as well Okay all right um thank you prasanna sir
Thanks for this session. Sure, sure. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Elinda. So let's. So, uh, uh, so I'll come back tomorrow, and we can actually get started with the shell shell scripting. Okay, and then uh, today, if if uh, students are able to basically co complete some of these, that will be good. Okay, and also I'll post some of these links in the chat here itself. The ones that I said I promise that I'll post, I'll just post some of those links here. Yeah, and if you can also uh, send any assignment if you have prepared already, that would be great. Otherwise, uh, and no push, we can share it tomorrow. To ah, sure. Yeah, yeah, we can share it tomorrow. But today, I mean, let uh, let the teams actually start looking into all the commands that I just explained today. Okay. I can quickly that. I'll I'll submit. I'll put a I'll put a PPT and send it across on the assignment for today. Sounds good, bro. Okay, I should post it here, right? I should uh, send the file in this chat, correct? You can, you can. Yes, you can. Okay, alrighty, I'll do that. I'm doing that right away. Next two minutes, you will have the assignment for today. <clears throat> Okay, I'm just sharing my screen so that, okay. Install VMware Workstation um, and, and load CentOS. And load CentOS. Um, please take help from your friends who have done it. Okay, uh, that's one. And then practice the following uh, commands. Um, yeah, greater than, less than, pipe, pipe, uh, VA, uh, then networking commands, right? Networking commands, such as ping, telnet, okay, uh, and then what else? Yeah, file, file commands such as less, more, tail, tar. Okay, uh, practice these commands. Uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, read more on ch mod and file permissions okay i'll give you a links here okay and also regular expressions for people who need to read on regular expressions get familiarized with the regular expressions. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, that's it. So I will send this, I'll post it. I'll post it, I'll post the file in the chat. Yeah, okay, I've posted the assignment in the chat. 
so uh, let's let's complete it to the extent possible and then we'll meet tomorrow for um, getting our hands dirty with shell programming shell scripting sure anna thank you thanks shall we make one open and break okay. all right yeah, yeah. thanks anna thanks I thanks hope... all thanks yeah. i hope sure you share it with us you yeah. see you all tomorrow yeah in chat i, I didn't read a message it is there just check it uh, prasanna sir has shared it to everyone i hope Let's... everyone have uh, received the presentation on the chat please download it I'm able to download the uh, challenge, so there are no issues. I think everyone. Yeah, it's not a uh, chat; it's a file. You need to download.